For all their notoriety, ACDC has always been known to be a very private band. They hold things close to the vest, and they've been known to be downright secretive sometimes. I have read biographies, I've scoured interviews, articles, and more to get you the full story. I'll be talking about many little-known facts and some interesting and not very well publicized stories of things that went on as they made their way to becoming one of the greatest rock and roll bands, if not in some people's opinion, the greatest rock and roll band of all time. I'll be talking about the band as I put on my makeup, but have no fear if you're just here for the scoop on ACDC, I will not be talking about makeup at all. I'll just list what I use down below in the information area in case you are interested. I hope you enjoy this very deep dive into ACDC. Oh, and if you're new to my channel, hi, I'm Nicole Sanchez. If you like music and you like makeup, you're in the right place. I'd love if you join my community by hitting that subscribe button. I want to give a huge shout out to Bailey Sarian who inspired this concept. She puts on her makeup while talking about true crime. I will link her channel down below in case you're interested in checking her out. ACDC is an Australian rock band that was formed in Sydney in 1973 by Scottish born brothers, Angus and Malcolm Young. Fun fact, in Australia they say Akadaka instead of ACDC. Now in case you're wondering why the name ACDC was chosen for the band, it was actually because of Malcolm and Angus's sister, Margaret. So Margaret liked to sew and she had a sewing machine and Malcolm and Angus had been tossing around band names for weeks and all of a sudden she noticed it said ACDC on the back for sewing machine, which stands for alternating current, direct current. Anyway, she threw it out there as an idea and they loved it. It's kind of a cute story. Malcolm and Angus were really young, so they didn't even get the other meaning that ACDC could mean. Uh, and it wasn't until they were in a cab one day and a cab driver mentioned it to them that they realized what that was. But obviously it didn't matter and they went with the name. Now, some sources say that it wasn't a sewing machine. They say that it was an amp or it was a iron or some other electronic device that they saw ACDC on to choose the name. Uh, but there are interviews with Angus and Malcolm talking about the sewing machine and their sister Margaret is actually in an interview talking about the sewing machine where the ACDC was seen. So I'm going to go with that. Just wanted to bring it up because there are some forums where people talk about another place that ACDC actually sprung from. Now the band's logo was designed in 1977 by Gerard Huerta. The logo first appeared on the international version of the album Let There Be Rock. At that point they'd used ACDC the lightning bolt through it but it didn't have that stylized look so he stylized it for that album. And then that is what was used for the logo from then on. A quick note about Gerard, he actually designed logos for Blue Oyster Cult, Willie Nelson, Boston, and lots of other rock bands. ACDC's leader was Malcolm Young, and he and his brother actually had six other siblings, so there were eight children in all. Their parents were William and Margaret Young, and all the kids were born in Glasgow, Scotland. The children in order of birth were Stephen, Margaret, Alex, John, William Jr., George. Take note of George, he's very important to the ACDC story. And the two youngest were Malcolm and Angus. The family lived in a very poor neighborhood, but supposedly the house was always filled with music because their sister Margaret was really into buying records and she'd bring them home. And it just sounds like they had a nice home life. Their brother Alex was the first one to make a career in music. He ended up playing bass and saxophone for Tony Sheridan. And what's really interesting about Tony Sheridan is that Tony Sheridan had been backed up by this little band from Liverpool who had not yet been discovered called The Beatles. Their brother George was inspired by all of this and decided he wanted to make a career in music too. The big freeze of 1963 was one of the worst winters on record for Scotland. It was rough. Apparently there were eight feet of snow and things were just really tough. And at the same time, there was an ad running where families could get assistance to move to Australia to start a different life. And the Youngs went ahead and took advantage of this. And in June of 1963, they emigrated to Australia, settling in Sydney. Malcolm at this point was 10 and Angus was 8 and both were already learning to play the guitar. Both of them are self-taught musicians and both say that Chuck Berry was a huge influence on them. And within a year of moving to Australia, Angus and Malcolm's brother George started a band called the Easy Beats and the Easy Beats just took off. They had this one hit called She's So Fine. It hit number one. It made them super popular with all the teens and in fact they were so popular that they're being compared to kind of the Beatlemania that was going on uh, in the UK and I guess all over the world 
that point, uh, and they called it Easy Fever. In 1966, the Easy Beats had a song that they put out called Friday on My Mind, and that took them international. It was just huge. They ended up being able to tour as an open act for the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones, how cool is that, right? Oh, and then at that same time, a magazine put out an article about the Easy Beats, and in it, they put the address of the Young family, right? So guess what happens, like 200, crazed girls from high school ran down to the house and were screaming and all excited. And about 20 girls pushed their way into the house and mauling everything, including Angus and Malcolm who were home at the time. And I guess it's the first time that they had, you know, screaming girl fans all over them. And apparently they liked it. Uh, so that was, I thought, just a hilarious story. During this time, Alex Young, their other brother, was hired by the Beatles' Apple Music as a songwriter. And he was part of the band Grapefruit. And that band was named by John Lennon. Talk about a talented family, right? Malcolm and Angus ended up quitting school because they wanted to pursue their music dreams, but they didn't just freeload off of mom and dad. Both of them had jobs. Malcolm worked a couple different jobs, uh, one of which was repairing sewing machines, and he was in a band called Beelzebub Blues. Beelzebub was later known as Red House, and they covered bands like Black Sabbath, Cream, and The Animals. In 1971, Malcolm was in a band called Velvet Underground, not the Lou Reed-led Velvet Underground, but they just, I don't know why they use that name. I mean, why would you name your band after a band that's already famous? I don't quite get that. Angus had his own band called Kentucky, and he was working on the side as a printing apprentice and at a butcher shop. With the money that Angus earned, he bought himself a new Gibson SG guitar. Angus went to lots of Malcolm's gigs with Velvet Underground, and in fact, Kentucky, Angus's band, the first paid gig that they had was opening for Malcolm's band. In 1972, Velvet Underground renamed themselves Pony, but after about a year or so, they ended up breaking up. Malcolm had quit, and then the band just didn't stay together. Malcolm started putting together a new band, and at that point, he wasn't even thinking about Angus being part of his band. Uh, Angus was doing just fine with Kentucky, and they had actually renamed themselves Tantrum. I love that name. I just think that's such a great name for some reason. Anyhow, so at that point, it wasn't even a thought that they'd be in a band together. Malcolm is 20 years old, Angus is 18, and this is when Malcolm asks Angus if he'd like to be in a band together. And lucky for us, Angus said yes. The funny thing is, is that when their parents found out they were going to be in a band together, they're like, oh yeah, we give that about a week, because I guess the brothers fought a lot. In December of 1972, the band that Malcolm and Angus were in together played together live for the first time at the Last Picture Show in Sydney. Malcolm and Angus's brother George started working with them to kind of refine their sound and help them out with their band. Can you imagine how helpful that would be? I mean, he has so much experience at this point. He's been in a successful band and can really help them with connections and all that. So that's just wonderful that they had that, you know, kind of family alliance to help out. ACDC played its first official gig at Checkers in Sydney on New Year's Eve. At this point, the lineup was, of course, Malcolm and Angus on guitars, Colin Burgess on drums, and Larry Von Kreit on bass, and Dave Evans was their singer. In January of 1974, ACDC's recordings were completed at EMI Studios in Sydney with Harry Vanda and George Young producing them. Now, Harry Vanda was in the Easy Beats with George. After the Easy Beats, they were a songwriting and producing duo, and they were known as Vanda and Young. Fast fact, you know the song The Sultans of Swing by Dire Straits? So you know when they sing Guitar George and Harry, they're talking about George Young and Harry Vanda. So after the songs were recorded, it's really interesting, George ended up redoing a whole bunch of the bass that was played by their bassist, Larry. And then shortly after that, they were at a gig playing and their drummer passed out, I guess, in the middle of the gig and Malcolm and Angus fired him on the spot. Now, their drummer, Colin, says that his drink was spiked um, and that's why it happened, but Angus and Malcolm didn't care and you know he was just out of the band. And then shortly afterwards, they went ahead and they fired Larry too. So so, you know, people have said that the Youngs are a little bit ruthless with um, how they fired people. I think that they just had a very clear direction for their band and knew how they wanted it to go, and they did what they had to do. They ended up hiring bassist Neil Smith and drummer Noel Taylor as replacements. Now, in April, the band played an outdoor concert in Sydney's Victoria Park, and this is the show at which Angus first performed in his schoolboy uniform. Until then, the band had just worn jeans and t-shirts on stage, and other than their lead singer, who went kind of more for a glam look. Now, you may wonder where the whole schoolboy uniform idea came up. Well, 
good old Margaret again. I guess she had said that she thought Angus looked really cute. You know, when he was younger, and would come home in his, in his school uniform and he'd grab the guitar that was bigger than him, she said. And, you know, she just threw that out there as an idea for him and he thought he would try it. Now, in the past, he had tried other types of costumes. He had tried being Zorro or Superman and even a gorilla outfit, which I can't even imagine how he'd run around playing the guitar at gigs in a gorilla suit the whole time. So I think that the school uniform also solved a problem because, you know, it's it's pretty comfy, I would think. Angus has said that the schoolboy uniform was really kind of a gimmick and he wasn't super into it in the beginning and I guess um, Malcolm really had to talk him into it. Angus has said that the most frightened he's ever been to go on stage was at that concert in Victoria Park where he wore the costume for the first time. They're so lucky to have had Margaret, you know? I mean, she comes up with all these great ideas. She ended up actually sewing lots of his school uniforms that you'll see him in. So Angus has also said that one of the reasons he runs around so much on stage is that when he was starting out, he figured that if he was moving, it'd be harder to hit him with a bottle if somebody from the audience threw something. So, you know, I guess that's why he was doing it in the beginning and then it just stuck and now it's part of that stage persona he has. It's said that the crowd at Victoria Park just thought that the school uniform was kind of amusing and cute. Um, and then I guess sometimes the reaction was a little different when they played some of the tougher pubs that they used to play at. Angus being in the school uniform really gave ACDC an identifiable image. You know what I mean? It gave them something to kind of be known for, remembered for. And this is the time of glam rock. I mean, you had David Bowie and Glitter Gary and, you know, all these other glam rockers out there. And what was cool about it was that it was recognizable and cool, but it was different and it wasn't glam. More hiring and firing went on in the summer of 1974. Neil Smith and Noel Taylor were fired and replaced by bassist Rob Bailey and drummer Peter Clack. And in June of 1974, ACDC signed a record deal with Albert Productions. Yay, they got their first record deal. They put out a debut single and it was called Can I Sit Next to You Girl and it had a very glam sound to it. By the middle of 1974, they built up a really strong live reputation and super fun. They ended up opening for Lou Reed Remember the Velvet Underground connection? It's just funny how the story kind of does this all over the place. Right around this time also is where Malcolm decided that he would play rhythm guitar and Angus should play lead. At the same time, there's a little bit of trouble in paradise. Malcolm and Angus started having huge problems with their lead singer, Dave. Uh, apparently it even led to brawling. So things were not going well there and they decided that they needed a new lead singer partially because of the fighting, but also because they didn't want to have a glam image and that's the image that he had. In 1974, promoter Michael Browning ended up hiring ACDC to play at his club, The Hard Rock. And so they played there and then, you know, went on. But then not too much longer after that, ACDC ended up kind of calling him out of the blue because their current manager had quit and they were kind of stranded. They were in Adelaide and they had no money. And so Michael bailed them out and then hired them to play again at his club and then ended up managing them. Now, part of the deal with him managing them was that, you know, input was going to be coming in from their brother George and Harry Vanda. As all this is going on, Bon Scott happened to be in the right place at the right time. An old friend of Bon's from a band he'd been in called the Valentines hired Bon to run errands for him as a favor. Now this friend, Vince Lovegrove, knew that ACDC was looking for a new lead singer, but he didn't tell Bon. Bon wasn't in a really good place in his life at this point. We'll talk all about Bon in a minute once we get through this section, um, but he just wasn't doing well. So, you know, he was hired to do these errands and then Vince said, hey, you know, you should really check out this band ACDC because they're really good. But Bond didn't really like ACDC. He had heard that they had kind of a glam lead singer and that they had a guitarist who ran around in a schoolboy uniform. He just thought they were really gimmicky, so he wasn't super into it, but he did go anyway. So Bond liked what he heard, and then when the gig was over, he went backstage and he started talking to Malcolm and Angus, who told him that they were actually looking for a new lead singer. And Bond took the opportunity to say, you know, he could be so much better than what they had going on right now. Uh, with their current singer. And then Angus and Malcolm and Bon, a few days later, whatever, snuck off to the rehearsal space and they tried out some songs with Bon. And they really, really liked what they heard and they hired him on the spot. Oh, one funny thing, when they were talking backstage, apparently Malcolm and Angus were joking with him, asking him if he was too old to cut it with the band because you know, he was really ancient at the age of 28 at that point. When Bon played his first gig with ACDC, apparently the whole band was just 
absolutely amazed because before the show, Bond ended up drinking like two bottles of bourbon. He was snorting coke, smoking a joint. And then he's like, okay, I'm ready to go on. And I mean, then he did do a really great job. Uh, interesting choice though for his wardrobe. Apparently he wore a pair of his ex-wife's underwear on stage, um, but it worked and Bond was part of the band. Let's talk about Bond Scott. Bond was born Ronald Belliford Scott on July 9th of 1946. He was born in Scotland too, but in Kieranmore, Scotland, and his parents were Charles, who was known as Chick, and his mom was Isabel, known as Issa. The family called Bon Ron, short for Ronald. Bon had an older brother who sadly died at nine months old, and he had a younger brother named Derek. Now, in case you wonder why Bon, whose name is really Ron, is called Bon, it's because his family also immigrated to Australia, and um, they moved, and then they moved again, and when he was around 10 years old, and they were living in Perth, he still had a very heavy Scottish accent, and the kids at school started calling him Bonnie Scott. Scotland, and then it got shortened down to Bon, and it just stuck. Bon's dad played in a bagpipe band, and he played the drums, and Bon started to do that too. But at around age 15, he kind of lost interest in that, and he quit the bagpipe band, and he quit school. He went to work as a farmhand, and this is when he started sometimes getting on stage and singing at different events. This is also when he got into some trouble and ended up in jail for nine months. After he left the band and school, you know, this was the age of rock and roll, and he grew his hair long, he got his first tattoo, and he started to get up on stage at some local events. So, you know, Bon was singing and stuff, and then he ended up kind of getting in trouble because uh, he was at one of these events which was, I guess, a dance, and he took a young girl out around the back of the building to fool around, and then when he got back, a bunch of the boys there kind of confronted him about it, and a fight broke out, the police were called, and, you know, Bon ended up taking off, and in the end, he was caught, and he was arrested, and he was charged with unlawful carnal knowledge, fleeing the police, and giving a false name to the police, so he ended up in jail for nine months, and during that time, he decided he was going to clean up his act, and he also decided to make rock and roll his future. Now, when Bond joined his first band in Perth, he wasn't making enough money to pay his bills, so he ended up working as a postman until 1967. Now, this is where Bond got his first taste of stardom. He'd been known to say that, you know, he didn't become a lead singer just because he was so, you know, passionate about singing. It was because he said that the front man got all the girls. It's so funny, I remember my son, when he was in his first band, he actually played at school, and then when it was over, oh my gosh, all the girls were surrounding these little eighth grade guys. It was so cute. So I guess it's always been a thing, huh? The Valentine's ended up recording two songs in 1969, and guess who they were written by? Vanda and Young. Now, Bond's band ended up opening up for the Easy Beats, and that's the first time that the connection was made between Bond and the Young family. Bond ended up leaving the Valentines, and then he joined a rock band called Fraternity. Fraternity, for a while, was living in a commune, and that's where Bond met his wife, Irene. About two years after meeting, Bond and Irene got married. Shortly after Irene and Bond got married, the band went to the UK with their partners to try to see how they could do in the UK, but there weren't very many gigs, they weren't making a lot of money, they tried to change the band's name to Fang uh, to sound more glam, uh, and they ended up opening for a band called Geordie. Okay, this is interesting. And Bond has been said to say that the lead singer of Geordie was so good. He was rolling around the floor screaming and rolling around yelling, and he said that it was the best little Richard impersonation he'd ever seen. Now, what Bond didn't know was that the lead singer of Jordy, Brian Johnson, Brian Johnson, was actually suffering from severe appendicitis and after the show had to be rushed to the hospital. So all that was actual real pain. <laughs> kind of cool that he worked it into the show, I guess. Um, but I guess he always told people about this amazing singer. In May of 1973, Bon and the band came back to Australia. Things were going well. Irene and Bon had only been married a year and a half, but they were fighting a lot uh, to the point where Irene said that the marriage was over. Uh, the band wasn't doing well. Bond had to take a job loading trucks at a fertilizer plant to make ends meet. So you know, things were just bad. When Irene told that the marriage was really over, he ended up drinking and got on his motorcycle. Oh, please don't drink and drive. Please, please, please. Um, and he ended up crashing his motorcycle and he was in a coma for three days. I think it was just him that got hurt during this, hopefully, <laughs> because I haven't 
read anywhere else that anyone else was involved in that accident. Um, but Irene was a stand-up person. She helped nurse him back to health, um, even though, you know, they did end their marriage at this point. Uh, and that's kind of where he was when he found ACDC. You know, he had a actual crap job loading fertilizer. He was getting divorced and he really had no money and he didn't have a band. Angus has said that Bond acted as a protective influence over him, kind of like the older, wiser man taking care of the you know, younger boy. He'd always say things like, what I do, you don't do, and you know, really kind of helped to protect Angus, who was still a teenager at the time. Angus has said that he had some wild nights kind of earlier on in the band's history, but he said, you know, overall, you know, wearing the schoolboy uniform is not really, really that sexy. And I guess his friends would always say, oh, he must be meeting lots of girls. And he said, yeah, meeting lots of girls, but most of them are not wanting to come home with me because there's nothing that sexy about a schoolboy uniform. Now the band became a bit notorious for their antics, but overall they were pretty clean living for that time because really Angus supposedly became a teetotaler. Like he didn't drink at all. I guess a little bit in the beginning, but you know, overall he'd be drinking hot tea, my favorite non-alcoholic beverage of choice. So 20 with Angus. Um, so, and then Malcolm, you know, was anti-drug. Angus was totally anti-drug. Um, Malcolm did have some issues with alcohol in the eighties. He ended up taking a bit of time off to deal with that and came out of it clean and sober. So that was great. Um, but Bond Scott was really the one who partook in the pharmaceuticals. You know, everyone else kind of smoked like chimneys and drank and, you know, the women and all that kind of thing. Um, but Bond is the one who really had that, you know, rock and roll lifestyle. I was reading that in the early days, ACDC played some really, really tough crowds at some really rough pubs. And in fact, I guess there's one time that they wouldn't go on stage because some guy in the audience had a meat cleaver and was like hacking at people in the audience. So it sounds like they played some pretty hardcore places. <laughs> There's some other funny stories. Like, I guess they had a broken down bus that just didn't run very well. And, you know, I guess one time, you know, Bond went into the venue where they were gonna play and said, hey, if anybody wants us to actually play tonight, we need 12 of you to come help us push our bus. I guess it didn't have brakes that worked very well either. And then, you know, Bond would do things like he'd wanna iron his jeans. So he'd get an iron from their bus, go into the pub where they're gonna play, kind of have people scooch over so he could iron his pants. He'd just take them off right there and iron them on the bar. So apparently he was very lovable. Everybody really liked him. Um, he just was kind of like very charming. Um, I guess he had that bad boy image, but was also nice. And they said that they called him Bon the likable because everybody liked Bon. Supposedly Bon did have quite the potty mouth though. Angus said it was like all profanity coming out of his mouth in the beginning when they met, but I guess over time that mellowed a bit. Shortly after Bond joined the band, they started recording High Voltage, the album, not the song. And they recorded the entire album in six days. At this point, they had Rob Bailey on bass and Peter Clack on drums, uh, but Rob the bassist ended up not contributing a lot to the album. And Peter the drummer supposedly only was actually recorded on one of the songs on the album because they used a session drummer for all the rest of the songs. So you can guess what happened to them. After they fired Peter, they ended up working with one other drummer for a little while, but that didn't really work out well. And then they finally found the right drummer, Phil Red. Phil was a self-taught musician and he was born in Melbourne. Not too long after the High Voltage release, they ended up firing their bassist and hired a new bassist, Paul Matters, but that didn't really work out. So you guessed it, he got fired too. And they needed a new bassist, so George ended up filling in for them until they found somebody. So the band ended up recording high voltage the song at this time now it was too late for it to make it onto the high voltage album but they did record the song high voltage was acdc's first real rock anthem and right around this time they found their bassist mark evans mark was a year younger than angus and he was born in melbourne it's now been about two years since Bond had his terrible accident where he was in the coma and all that, and he's still not making very good choices. Uh, he ended up meeting up with a girlfriend of his who unfortunately was a heroin user, um, and he was with her and her sister, and they're both doing it, and he decided to try it, and it was really bad. He took one hit, I guess he turned blue, fell over, and the paramedics made it there just in time to save his life. So Bond is unfortunately kind of still on this road. This is just so bad for him. One really interesting thing that I was super surprised to learn was that ACDC, you know, they've got this total rock image and all that. So, you know, you think that their audience is, you know, at least 50% male, 50% female. Well, when they were starting out, apparently their main audience 
was young girls, young teenage girls. That's who's going to the concerts and that's who was super, super into them. Um, so I was really surprised to hear that because I would have always thought with their sound and everything, you know, it'd be as much guys as girls. Uh, and this is one reason why they really wanted to get out of Australia and, you know, go to the UK and tour Europe and see if they could build up something other than kind of this teeny bopper fan base that they had. Their next album was produced. This is TNT we're on now. And that was also produced by the brother George George and Harry. Most of the recording was laid down in July of 1975, and the opening track is It's a Long Way to the Top if you want to rock and roll. And as we all know, it has that cool bagpipe solo and bagpipes in the song. I mean, really, really an innovative idea. Now, what's super funny about this is that the way the bagpipe thing happened is that George knew that Bond had been in a bagpipe band. Well, what he didn't realize was that Bon played the drums. So he didn't know this and he was like, oh, let's put bagpipes in this. And they went and bought bagpipes, which apparently are not inexpensive. And I guess it became very clear very quickly when they were having all kinds of trouble putting the bagpipes together, that Bon had never played the bagpipes. Well, in the end, Bon ended up self-teaching himself to play the bagpipes well enough to do the solo. But it was really only played live with the bagpipes and Bon playing them about 30 times. Part of the reason was somehow when you had the bagpipes in there, everybody had to tune to the bagpipes. And I guess it was just kind of a really big deal. Um, so in the future, when they would play the song live, which for some reason, they still didn't do very often, it seems, is they would, you know, have Angus either do a guitar solo or they would use a recording of the bagpipes um, when they were playing that song live. The last time they played with the bagpipes live was in 1976. They're playing at a high school and Bon unfortunately set the bagpipes down on the side of the stage and a bunch of teenagers got to them and tore them apart. So that was the end of the bagpipes. Could you imagine you're in high school and the band that plays at your dance is ACDC. From the beginning, ACDC really knew how to write a catchy song that had a real groove to it that just grabs you. I mean, how often have you been at a concert where before the concert starts, they play ACDC right before to get people pumped up or at sporting events? I mean, it's just such an amazing sound. The TNT album was released in December of 1975 and made it to number two on the Australian charts. This was really cool for Australia to have their own, you know, big rock band because this is the time like of Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple. In December of 1975, ACDC signed a worldwide deal with Atlantic Records. This was super exciting because Atlantic is who Led Zeppelin was signed with. Now, Atlantic wanted ACDC to make an international release album, and they were going to take the best from High Voltage and TNT and make the album out of that. They were also going to have them tour in Europe for the first time, which was really exciting for the band. In December of 1975, they also recorded a song called Jailbreak. So apparently Bond was so drunk while they were recording that song Jailbreak that, and he put like his all into it, that as soon as the song was done being recorded, he just passed out cold on the floor. That international album that we were just talking about that was a mix of high voltage and TNT album songs, well, they ended up calling it high voltage just to make it even more confusing <laughs> as to their albums. You know, if you ever look at kind of their discography, you'll you'll see that and it just, just that's kind of why it worked out that way. ACDC was supposed to head to Europe, right, to do their tour and they were supposed to open for a band called Backstreet Crawler, but unfortunately their lead guitarist, who is the band leader ended up passing away of a pulmonary embolism on an airplane and I guess it's because he was using a lot of intravenous drugs and somehow that's what happened. Uh, again, don't do drugs. And so that ended up getting canned and they weren't quite sure when they were going to play. Right when they were about to leave Australia to go to Europe, Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap was finished and they did a last concert with their hometown crowd and it's kind of funny at this concert. Angus did something that kind of became a thing uh, from then on at shows. While they performed their song called The Jack, he would moon the audience. And uh, yeah, The Jack, in case you didn't know, The Jack is actually Australian slang for a venereal disease. I did see a bit of footage of Angus at a 2010 concert and you know, he's looking like he's going to moon the audience and all that again, and he makes this big deal. But when he drops his pants, you know, now that he's quite a bit older, probably a good choice, he had on boxers with just the ACDC logo, you know, on his buns. So, you know, he's still doing it, but you're no longer seeing the goods. 
ACDC made their debut in the UK at the Red Cow Pub. There are only 30 people there, but apparently they all like left in between sets with calling their friends saying, you've got to come see this band. I mean, they really, really got to people. At this performance, Bond ran into Margaret Smith. Her nickname was actually Silver. That's kind of a cool nickname, Silver. Uh, anyway, and she and Bond had been together when uh, Bond was in Australia, and she had no idea that he was going to be in the band that she went to see. She just heard that there was this up-and-coming band that was going to be playing that night at the Red Cow. And anyway, sparks flew, and those two got together, and in the end, the whole time they were in the UK, he ended up living with her rather than with a band, which is what everyone else was doing. They're all living together, and I guess and Malcolm, you know, weren't big fans of this idea because apparently it was reported that she was a heroin user and they just didn't think it was really a good idea for Bond to be around that. Um, but you know, Bond obviously did his own thing and lived with her. Silver ran with the rock and roll crowd. I guess she was known to hang out with Ronnie Wood of the Rolling Stones, the band UFO, and Thin Lizzy. Now the punk scene was in full swing when ACDC got to the UK and they did not consider themselves punk at all. They didn't like being referred to being punk. And apparently when one of the magazines called them an Aussie punk rock band, they did not like it at all. Just for a point of reference, this is when the Ramones made their debut. You know, the I want to be sedated in rock and roll high school. Yeah, so this is kind of the timing of what's going on right now. Apparently when the people at Atlantic Records pitched to Malcolm that they wanted to position them as a punk band, he told them literally to F off. It was super cool that ACDC's European tour kicked off in Glasgow, where they were born. This tour was called the Lock of Your Daughters Tour. It took place in June and July of 1976, and they took the line, Lock of Your Daughters, from the song TNT. Now, as this tour ended, ACDC started getting some really great press, and they continued touring, and in November, they released Dirty Deeds, Done Dirt Sheep. Now, there were two versions, one for Australia and one for Europe, and we still did not get a version of it in America. If you're wondering why we didn't get one in America, the label thought that it was too rough edged and too hard for America, because at that time it was bands like Fleetwood Mac and like Boston was the big breakout rock group. And I love Boston absolutely love Boston, but they're very melodic and very perfect sounding, which was very, very, very different from ACDC. So they refused to release the album in the United States. Now, High Voltage had been released in the United States, but amazingly, Rolling Stone gave it a bad review. Wait, let me read to you exactly what they said about it. So the writer Billy Altman wrote, those concerned with the future of hard rock may take solace in knowing that with release of the first album by these Australian gross out champions. The genre has unquestionably hit its all time low. It's also been said during this time period, Atlantic wanted them to get a new singer. They thought that Bond was too hard to understand and they just thought that the way he came across, they didn't like it. But you know, thank goodness they shut that idea down and kept Bond. In late 1976, ACDC went back to Australia and they were touring and the tour did not go well. This was a giant dose of rock and roll tour and they were going to venues and at one of them, there were only like 60 people. And you're wondering, gosh, what's happening? Cause they did so well in Europe. They have been doing well in Australia. They were kind of in their home country. And I guess that people were feeling resentful. They thought ACDC had been gone too long in Europe and that they had kind of forgotten about their roots. And so people weren't really going to their shows too much. They started putting together their next album, Let There Be Rock. Angus has said, it's an effing good guitar album. Fast fact, while they were recording the song Dog Eat Dog, apparently Angus's amp caught fire and because the song was going so well, George didn't even point it out until the song was over. So yeah, they were on fire. Be right back, I'm gonna put my lashes on. In April, ACDC started the Let There Be Rock tour. They were opening for Black Sabbath. Now, Bon Scott and Ozzy Osbourne got on really, really well, but Geezer Butler and Malcolm did not get along well at all. And in fact, there's a story that Geezer pulled a knife on Malcolm. Well, there's also one that says Malcolm pulled it on Geezer, but uh, the main story I heard was that apparently Geezer was kind of bitching and moaning about things in life and Malcolm wasn't very sympathetic. They were at a hotel bar in Zurich and then Geezer pulled a knife on Malcolm and supposedly Ozzy happened to walk into the bar right as this is going on and he told, you know, Geezer was like an effing idiot and to go up to bed or something. So I guess Ozzy, if you can remember that day or night or 
decade, <laughs> he would be the one who would know what really happened. The last date of this tour is the last time that Mark Evans, their bassist, played with ACDC. He and Angus were not getting along, and you know what happens when you're not getting along with Angus or Malcolm. So he was out. A few weeks later, they hired Cliff Williams to be their bassist. Now, on July 25th, 1977, Let There Be Rock was released in the US and it had two songs that were different than the Australian version. It also had a different cover than the Australian version, which featured for the first time the now famous iconic ACDC logo that Gerard Huerta designed. ACDC kicked off their American tour in Texas and Bon almost gave everybody a heart attack. Apparently he had taken off the night before with a bunch of guys to go party and he'd been gone all night, all day. It was a half hour before showtime and then he rolls up with them and they dropped him off and it was all fine. But yeah, so Bon was still the party animal of all party animals. This American tour was epic. They were opening for Foreigner and Santana and Blue Oyster Cult and Styx and they co-headlined with Cheap Trick for a while too. Next, ACDC recorded and released Power Age. A little factoid for you, Power Age was recorded mainly at night. They'd usually start at 8 o'clock at night and then record all night long until the sun came up and they recorded that album in eight weeks. Back in the 70s, having a live album was a really big deal, and ACDC recorded one. I remember listening to lots of live albums back in the day. So ACDC recorded one, and this is the only live album that ever featured Bon Scott. The album was titled If You Want Blood, and it was recorded in Glasgow. Now, I have to mention day three of the Day of the Green in 1978. ACDC was going to be first on that morning, and they were on at like 10.30, which is, you know, pretty early for start. But uh, Bill Graham, the famous concert promoter, had really kind of pumped them up on local radio, and so pretty much the stadium was full when ACDC went on, and I guess they just crushed it. I guess it was just really awesome. Funny story um, somewhere that I read was that I guess Eddie Van Halen was waiting in the wings. I guess Van Halen was going to go on next. And when he heard them, he was like, oh my gosh, we have to go on after these guys. And I guess it was a little bit intimidating because they just, you know, were so, so good. And apparently this happened a lot while they were touring. A lot of the bands that they would open for, they were as good as or even better than. I remember, oh God, I think it was like 1984. I saw... I think it was the Scorpions and Bon Jovi, who at that point only had like their first hit coming out, opened for them. And that was kind of the first time I'd ever been to a show where I was like, oh my gosh, that opening band just totally killed it. And I thought they were just as good as the Scorpions. And I love the Scorpions. And Malcolm tied the knot with his wife, Linda, in 1979. There's not much known about her at all. You can see photos of her, you know, here and there, but I just couldn't find any information about her or how they met or anything again, that total private thing that the band had going on. Anyway, uh, they were happily married, it seems, because they were married until his untimely death in 2017. And they have two children, Ross and Kara. Now for their next album, the label wanted some changes. They wanted a different producer. So this was pretty touchy because George was Malcolm and Angus's brother and then Harry was like a brother. They'd been with them from the beginning. They'd helped them on everything else. But after, I guess, a lot of discussion, it was decided that to get to the next level, they really needed a different producer, you know, because the label really wasn't loving the ideas that Harry and George had for the next album. So uh, they went ahead and went with another producer. So this producer was Eddie Kramer, and they started out with him, and it just wasn't going well. Malcolm ended up ending the sessions with him, and he ended up calling Michael Browning, their manager, and was telling them, look, we need a different producer. Now, at that time, Michael was living with Mutt Lang. You all know who Mutt Lang is, right? Super famous producer. He's the one who did that gloop and gloop and gloop and gloop at the beginning of the Def Leppard song, Rock of Ages. And he was married to Shania Twain, and he's produced just a bajillion albums. And what you might not know about him, if you know all that stuff, is that he actually contributed some backing vocals to the ACDC album because he's a really good singer. So Mutt, of course, said yes, and he ended up producing the Highway to Hell album. Right around this time also, the band ended up letting Michael Browning go. Uh, they signed with Labor Krebs, hopefully I said that right, that was kind of the big kahuna agency of the time. And again, supposedly they needed this kind of management, you know, to keep going up in the rock world. 
So Highway to Hell is what broke ACDC in America. I mean, they just blew up. Um, but one funny thing is this one writer, Phil Sutcliffe, he wrote another album about humping and booze. 1980 was off to a great start. Touch Too Much was hitting the top 30 in the UK, and Angus got married. Angus married Ellen von Lachum. Apparently they had been dating for about two years. They didn't end up having any children, and they are still married to this day, 40 years later. On Monday, February 18th, Bond called his then on-again, off-again girlfriend, Silver, to see if she wanted to go to some shows with him. And she didn't want to, but she had a friend visiting her, Alistair Kinnear, and she said, well, why don't you just go with him? And Bond thought that was a good idea, and so the two of them went out. Apparently, they drank a lot, and at the end of the night, Alistair tried to take Bond home, but then he couldn't wake Bond up, he couldn't get him out of the car, so then he drove him back to his house again, couldn't wake him, couldn't lift him, couldn't get him out of the car, covered him with a blanket, and went into his apartment to go to sleep. Okay, don't ever do that. If you've got somebody who's passed out and, oh my gosh, you don't leave them. And then if you really can't wake them, they probably need medical attention. So Alistair went back to his apartment and went to sleep and slept till the next evening. He didn't go back down to his car. Now he did cover Bond with a blanket. I think I said that, but if I didn't, he did cover Bond with a blanket. But I mean, who knows what went on? Um, I mean, I don't know if it was too cold that night or if it was the alcohol or something else. But when he got back down there, Bond still wasn't moving. And sadly that evening, Bond was pronounced dead on arrival at King's College Hospital. There's been a lot of mystery about what actually killed Bond Scott. Was it alcohol poisoning? Was it drugs? Was it something else? The coroner ended up saying that it was severe alcohol poisoning and called it death by misadventure. This was a super sad time for the band. They'd lost their friend. They'd lost their singer. I mean, it was just really, really bad for them, I guess. And in what I read, they didn't know what they were going to do. Were they going to go on? Were they going to quit the band? They just didn't know what they were going to do. And when they were at Bond's funeral, Bond's dad, Chick, I guess, took Malcolm aside and said some nice things to him and then told him that they had his blessing to move forward with a band without Bond. So the band ended up throwing themselves back into work. They said that it was kind of therapy to be able to play again, but they needed a new lead singer. Now, in early 1980, Brian Johnson, who was the lead singer of Geordie, the one who was rolling around screaming on the floor that Bond had actually thought was so awesome, was not doing well. He had two kids, he was getting divorced, and he didn't have any money. Uh, things were not looking very good for him. He was still singing once in a while, but you know, not regularly, and he just kind of thought that his whole rock and roll career was pretty much over. Brian was living with his parents and, you know, he was just pretty bummed out at this point. Now, interestingly, a fan sent ECDC a Geordie album with a note on it that said, you got to listen to this lead singer. And then Mutt Lang had actually also recommended Brian Johnson. Now, at this point, Angus and Malcolm, nobody was putting together the story, you know, that Bond had told them about this lead singer of Geordie. And eventually, I think it was Al Angus who figured it out and was like, oh yeah, that's who, you know, Bond had thought was so good. And in the end, he was put onto a list of singers that they wanted to talk to and audition. But the problem was nobody could find Brian Johnson. He was living at his parents' house right now. He wasn't really big on the rock scene. And so they started auditioning other singers. When the label finally got a hold of Brian, Brian was like, okay, well, who is this band? Because they weren't telling him. They just said, oh, a famous band wants you to audition to sing for them. And he was like, well, could you tell me who? And the lady, I guess, said she couldn't tell him. And he goes, well, could you at least give me the initials of who it is? Because if I have to go all the way to London to audition, I'm really broke and this is going to be kind of a big deal for me. And so I need to know who it is. And so she said, well, it's AC and then DC. So I don't know if she was trying to help him out or if she was just kind of dumb, but he figured out who it was. And I guess he got really nervous. His car, I guess, was in terrible shape. So he borrowed a friend's car to go to the audition. And then it got a flat tire on the way. And then it was super nervous. And I guess he was across the street for a while, kind of drinking tea and trying to calm himself down. And then when he got in there, there were like roadies and stuff out. And he at first thought they were the band. So it was just, you know what I mean? I mean, the poor guy must have been a ball of nerves. And then he got finally in and met Malcolm and Angus and the rest of the guys. And he said they were really nice. They seemed like regular guys and really put him at ease. And he auditioned and I guess it went really, really well. In fact, Phil Rudd immediately was like, oh my God, let's hire this guy. But Malcolm and Angus wanted to have another audition. They set up the second audition and Brian was late because he had scored a gig to record a advertisement for Hoover. And, you know, it was going to pay 350 pounds which was a lot of money and the guy was broke and he figured well he didn't want to give that up because if ACDC didn't work out you know he could really use that money so I guess he did his little 
deal there singing for the Hoover ad and then he zipped over to the audition. Then later in March one night after celebrating his dad's birthday, Brian picks up the phone and it's Malcolm Young asking him to join the band and he was just so shocked about it and then he thought somebody was kind of pulling his leg. He told Malcolm, could you call me back in 10 minutes? I want to make sure this isn't just someone pulling a prank on me or something. Malcolm called back and said, hey, you know, are you going to join us? And he of course said yes and that is how Brian Johnson ended up joining AC. DC. I guess when Brian told his younger brother, who was like a hardcore ACDC fan, his brother thought it was an April Fool's joke or something. And he's like, no, no, it's really real. Brian jumped right in with ACDC. They asked him to help write lyrics. He's a really good lyricist. He wrote a lot of the lyrics on Back in Black. And a little bit after they'd written all the songs, they jumped on a plane, flew to the Bahamas to record the tribute album to Bon Scott, Back in Black, that was produced by Mutt Lang. Back in Black ended up being one of the biggest albums of all time. When you look at the top albums, it's usually in there right after Thriller. Depending on what list you look on, sometimes it's number two, sometimes it's like number four or five, but it sold over 50 million albums. I'm done with my makeup and we've only scratched the surface of the Brian Johnson years. So I think that I probably need to do a part two to this. Give this video a thumbs up if you'd like to see a part two and let me know in the comments, what's your favorite ACDC song or if you can't narrow it down to a song, album. Oh, and then don't forget to hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications if you want to find out when I have another video coming out. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.